Well, I guess I should get started. I don't usually do this, but let me do that thing. Because I want to make sure I make sure everybody's top hat it at least once, you know. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, we could do that. I mean, let's see here. Do 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 do. I'm on the cusp of spending class time for top hat. This is this feels wrong. Yowzers! Shame on me. Sixteen, seventeen. Well, that's kind of cool. The code is sixteen, seventeen. The uh, course enter join code is 435-151. All right, well, with that nonsense behind us, let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this day. Again, I thank you for this class, for these students. Just ask that you to bless our work today. Help us to glorify you, Lord, in what we do. In the name of my prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so today we are talking about spanning and linear independence. And so the following lemma is key. So here is the lemma. The finite F linear uh, combination of finite f-linear combinations is, guess what, a finite f-linear combo. Um, of vectors. Uh, this is all from some set S, from some S, which is a subset of a vector space. All right, so we're we're in the context that we're in a vector space over F. All right. The proof is simple enough. Just trash markers out of my way here. All right, so. So let's suppose that um, x sub i is equal to the sum over c i j y j for j equals 1 to, oh, I don't know, um, n sub j, I suppose. All right. <clears throat> for um, i equals to 1 to, Da, 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 da. Um, S and um, C, I, J are elements of F, right? Then <clears throat> if we look at the sum, let's say I equals 1 to S of B sub I x sub i, right? So what am I doing? I'm looking at a finite linear combination of finite linear combinations, right? Here I'm supposing that the, um, I guess I should probably, I probably should tell you this, y sub j, an element of s, all right, for all j. I'll make that a capital then. Are you happy? Happy Violet, is that better? No. Sprano says that if you stop, he says you should worry if, if you stop picking on the person, then you should worry, right? Yeah. So, I don't pick on some of you guys at all, so I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> I guess it just means I don't know you yet, but um, anyway, so uh, some I equals one to S of this, right? 
And then we can just plug in the other thing, right? So we've got the sum um, i equals 1 to s of b sub i sum j equals 1 to n sub j of c i j y j, right? But by properties of finite sum, that's the same as, you know, the sum over, um, let me just drop the details here for a second. The sum over i and j of b i, maybe I should write the details. I'm sorry guys, I'll, I'll get with it here eventually. Sum i equals 1 to s, sum j equals 1 to n sub j of b i c i j y j. But what is this? A finite sum. Yeah, this is a finite sum, right? Where you're taking numbers in the field times the vectors in S. So this is again a finite linear combination in S, right? So this is an element of the span of S again, if you like. We introduced that notation a couple classes ago, I think. Right, the span of S is the set of all possible finite linear combinations um, of vectors taken from S. Yeah. I guess you also have to require that BI is in that. BI is what? The BI is in the mm. span. In the field, yeah. Um, for any B sub I and F, right? So anyway, the, the, the lemma follows, right? If you don't like this, you could write it out with the plus dot 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 notation. That also makes it pretty obvious pretty quickly. Yep. So what's the NJ for? Oh, well, I just have, that's the number of uh, Ys that I'm using to form the XI. And maybe that should be not N sub J, but it should be what? That should be what? Not J, but what? There's, that, you're right, the J there is wrong. You're wrong. That that is a self-referential. I, I can't put a, I can't put the index of summation here and there. That's not that's not allowed. What I meant to put here was what. This free index over here. I meant to put an i there. It should be i. Uh, now another way to get around this, which probably would have been smarter, but oh well, I'm, I'm where I am, is just to say s is a finite set. And like if I had the, there were n things in S, I could just make all of these sums over n things and just let, you know, coefficients be zero. Yeah? No? No? Okay. So, um, like if S is an infinite set, then our definition was span of S is equal to the sum i equals 1 to, say, n of ci we could say SI such that, you know, CI is an element of um, the field and SI is an element of S for I in N. So like the span of S is the set of all possible finite linear combinations. In the context that this is a finite list, like, like that, Without loss of generality, you can just say that this is the sum i equals 1 to n of ci, you know, vi, such that ci is in the field, right? The n is, the n here is, there, there's no need for varying over all possible n because the n is just the number of things you're forming the span of. A lot of times that's our context. We're looking at the span of a finite set of things. So like we don't need to do varying sized sums. We can just do some that is as big as the number of things we're spanning. All right, are we good? All right. Oh, while we're at it, what else did we say? The span of the empty set was the set just containing zero, right? All right. Now, <clears throat> so, I guess an example I could give, by the way, so here's a couple. If we had the span of E1, EN, um, example two, we could do like the span of 
EIJ such that 1 less than or equal to I less than or equal to M, 1 less than or equal to J less than or equal to N. Okay, so like in the context of over the F and, and over, over the field F, where that's the standard basis and the matrix units we defined before, right? This is exactly all column vectors and this is exactly all M by N matrices. All right. Um, I guess I should mention, guys, in the book, he does this. Right? That's the book's notation for M by N matrices. I don't use exactly the same notation as the book. In fact, I think most mathematicians find my notation to be distasteful, but they're stupid. So, <laughs> just kidding. We don't say stupid in my house. Well, that's not true. Daniel can tell you. Mm. Okay, so, theorem. And this theorem is I can't, this theorem is so simple, but if there's any theorem that's underappreciated and underused by students in Math 321, it is the following theorem. This theorem is so wonderful, so simple, and so so mis, mis, just unappreciated. Let V be a vector space over a field F. All right. Um, And suppose you've got S, which is a subset of V, all right? Then the span of S is a subspace of V. That's the theorem. Now, the theorem, the theorem in my notes, theorem 2.35, goes on to say more. It says, moreover, that the span of S is the smallest subspace. In, in V, which contains S. Span S is the smallest subspace of V containing S. Let us prove this theorem. Here we go. Proof. All right, so um, notice zero. Um, all right, well, I guess the proof's got two parts, right? If S is empty, then the span of the empty set is zero, which, by the way, is a subspace of V. We're done. Right? That's why we need to define <laughs> the span of the empty set to be zero, the zero subspace, partly for this theorem. So what happens if S is not equal to the empty set? What does that mean? Well, there, there must exist an x, let's say x sub naught in S, right? And 0 times x naught is equal to 0 is an element of the span of S, right? Therefore, the span of S is what? It's not empty, right? It's got 0 in it, yep. When you say smallest subspace of B containing S, do you mean containing the set S or containing all the elements of S? That's what containing a subset means. Containing all the elements or containing the set itself? Containing all the elements. I mean, that's what we mean by a subset's inclusion. Okay. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense to say the set is an element of it. I mean, we're not talking about a power set or something here. Hmm. Interesting question. Um, okay, so then span of S is not empty, right? What are we going to use? We're trying to prove something's a subspace, right? It's a subset. Is it a subset? Why is the span of S a subset of V? But 
why would that make it a subset of the vector space? What is span S by definition? It is what? The set of all linear combinations of vectors from S, right? Can you take a linear combination of vectors in a vector space and get outside the vector space? No, I mean, so by the definition of vector space, span S is necessarily a subset of V. Yeah? So, by definition, a vector space, we see the span of S is a subset. So we've got a non-empty subset of V, right? And if this wasn't clear already, it'll become very clear from what we're about to write. Let, I mean, if you don't, if you don't believe this sentence, we're about to give further evidence of it and what follows anyway. So check this out. Let X and Y be elements of the span of S and C a number in the field. Then what? Then CX plus Y is an element of the span of S by the lemma. Because CX plus Y is a linear combination of linear combinations, right? X is a linear combination in S. Y is a linear combination in S. Therefore, CX plus Y is a finite linear combination of finite linear combinations. And as such, it is a finite linear combination, which means it's in the span. So the lemma does the hard work for us, right? It proves that the subspace test theorem works, right? So thus, x plus y and cx are elements in span s. So therefore, span s is a subspace of the vector space by subspace test. Now I haven't proved the second sentence. Second, I haven't proved the second sentence yet. How do you prove that the span of S is the smallest subspace? How do you make an argument like that? Yeah. Would you do a proof by contradiction, assuming that there is a smaller subspace? Um, you could try that, I suppose. Um, let's kind of do that. Let's, let's aim in that direction. Let's. Let's let W be any subspace of V which contains S. Let W be any sub, so kind of in the same direction what you're saying, but a little bit more constructive. Let W be any subspace of V containing S, all right? Um, so by definition, W is closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition. And so all linear combination of vectors in S must be in W. <coughs> Hence, the span of S must be a subset of W, right? So if S is a subset of W, and any linear combination of vectors in W is automatically in W because W is a subspace, right? The subspace test says that if, among other things, well, not even the subspace test, just the definition of subspace is that W is a vector space on its own right, right? So it's closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition. So this implies that the span of S is a subset of W, all right? Is it subset or is it contained in? Subset. Also, <clears throat> if V is an element of S, right, then this is, a, this is an important like little trick, proof trick. V is equal to 1 times V, all right? That is a linear combination. Therefore, this is an element of span S, right? Hence, 
S is a subset of span S. <coughs> Um, so the first sentence means that S uh, is a subset of, uh, of W. Right. So we have span S as a subset of W. Well, anyway, I'll let you guys finish it here. There's not much more to say, I think, but anyway. All right, so <clears throat> where could you use this theorem? I call this the span theorem, all right? If something's a span, it's a subspace. So like, how would we apply this theorem? Let, let me look at an example here, example three. Um, <clears throat> How about this? If we have W is equal to the set of, oh, I don't know, um, well, let me do something that actually, let me do something really, really easy here. So, like, we could have x plus y, um, x plus z and um, y and z like that, all right, such that uh, x, y, z, and I'll make it interesting. Let's make it in z mod 17. <laughs> okay, there you go. Is this a, so the question is, is this a subspace of like z 17, Four, I think. How many we got? One, two, three. It's four, four components, right? So if you did, if you use the subspace test theorem, it would be kind of a drag. You'd have to pick two of these, pick a scalar, show that the scalar times a vector plus the other vector is again of this form. It's a little bit of trouble. Check this out. I can rewrite this as x times 1 comma 1 comma 0 comma 0 plus y times 1 comma 0 comma 1 comma 0 plus z times 0 comma 1 comma 0 comma 1 such that x, y, z are in z17. Now it's manifestly a span. This is exactly the span of the set of vectors 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. As such, it is a subspace by the span theorem. That is much easier than writing out the subspace test for this example, right? So if you can see something's a span, great, it's a subspace. Yeah? Shall I work another example? Let me work one that's a little bit, a little bit more out there. This is usually where I make a bad decision and waste a half of a class, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I won't do that. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Example, what are we on? Example four? All right. Let's, let's, let's look at, um, the question is, is t squared and is t squared minus 1 an element of w 
right? Um, which is equal to, let us say, the span of <coughs> um, t squared uh, t and um, uh, t plus 2. All right. So I've asked you some questions like this in the homework. I should talk to you at least about one of them. Generally speaking, though, um, there are many more examples in my notes than I'll cover in class, and I would encourage you to read those. Like part of the homework is for you to, not all of the homework is going to look like class. All right, like class is going to be more focused on theorems in here than calculations, but I will try to do some calculations here as well, like this one. So the question then is like, um, let's see here. Can we write, you know, is t squared equal to some constant times t squared plus some other constant times t plus some third constant times t plus 2? Right? Can we actually solve those? Right? Yeah, I think so. So what we can do is we can equate coefficients, right? Um, so we have 1 is equal to C1. We have 0 is equal to C2 plus C3. And so this is from T squared. This is from T. And then, of course, the constants, right? So we got 0 is equal to 2C3. So what's that tell us? Well, apparently C3 is 0, right? Apparently C1 is 1. Um, actually, I'm being very stupid here, aren't I? Um, <laughs> so this tells us what? You're like, what are you doing? This is obvious that it's true, right? Because you just got done proving what? What did I just get done proving? The element of the span is in that span. Mm-hmm. Is t squared, so t squared's here. So yes, t squared is in the span. This set is a subset of the span. It is always the case that s is a subset of the span of s. So we don't need to think about that or calculate anything. I'm a dummy. Let us make it more interesting. Minus 1. I mean, I mean, minus 1 this here. How does that change my equations? Make them a little more interesting, right? Well, not too much more interesting. We still have the same. The difference is that the constant term, we've got a minus 1 down here, right? So instead of getting C3 equal to 0, we get C3 is equal to minus a half, right? And then feed that back up into here, what do we get? C2 is minus C3, therefore what? That's 1 half. So apparently we should do C1 equal to 1, and C2 is a half, and C3 is minus 1 half. Let's, let's tr check our uh, proof of concept, right? See here, so uh, 1 times T squared um, plus 1 half times what? T minus 1 half times what? T plus 2. Did it work? What happens here? The T and the T over 2 and T over 2, they'd be canceling? Right, and uh, you got yourself a t squared and uh, minus two over two. I believe that is a t squared minus one. So, indeed, doodly, that is an element of the span of S, where I have defined this as S as to not write those symbols again. All right. I would encourage you to do the same in your homework. Label things. Use your labels. Although not labeling something and using a label. Is a surefire way to lose points. I don't have any yet. I want to get some. My advisor told me one thing. He taught me one thing. He taught me that if you don't take off points when you're grading, it's not grading. So he said he always had to take off some points just so he felt like it was real grading, you know? <clears throat> he was very, he's, he's actually a very kind grader, but anyway. Okay, so we just use something called equating coefficients here, right? So what is that about? Yeah? 
Where's that coming from? Oh, oh, I remember the other example I was going to show you guys. Um, rats. So the other um, mission critical examples to talk about in here are the, uh, the, you know, the subspaces for a matrix, right? There are three, well, at least three um, subspaces corresponding to a matrix, right? And um, so given A, which is, you know, like an M by N matrix over a field, we define the null space of A to be X in Fn such that AX equals to zero. This is the so-called null space of a matrix, all right? Um, you can prove, how would you prove this is a subspace? Use subspace test theorem, okay? Zero is in there, so it's not empty. If I have X and Y are both in the null space, that means AX is equal to zero and AY is equal to zero. Therefore, A times X plus Y is equal to zero plus zero, which is zero. And of course, if we have C times X, then A times CX is C times AX, which is C times zero, which is zero. It is easy to prove that this is a subspace by the subspace test theorem, right? Then the other characteristic space is the column space of A. And the column space of A is defined to be the span of the columns of A. And this is a subspace of Fm. Why? Why is that a subspace of Fm? No, easier, easier, lazier still. That's right. It is a span. Therefore, it is a subspace. By this, see, underappreciated theorem. It's too, it's too good to be true, isn't it? It feels too good to be true, but that is a, that's the theorem. If it's a span, it's a subspace, right? And um, there's also the row space of A, which is the span of the rows of A. That is a subspace of F1 by N. I think. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, again, a subspace because it is a span. An interesting theorem that, we'll, that you may or may not know is that the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space. Um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of the story because we don't know what dimension is, right? So in view of that, let us talk about linear independence. What's that about? Independence, I can't spell. Um, so LI for short. And linear independence we define as follows. Yeah, we have S, a subset of V, where V is a vector space, over F. All right. The set of vectors, um, S, is linearly independent if and only if for any finite subcollection. So you got V1, V2. Da, 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 VK, a subset of S, and constants C1, CK in the field. This linear combination C1, V1 plus C2, V2, da, 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 plus CK, VK equals to zero 
implies C1 equals to zero, C2 equals to zero, all the way on down the line, CK is equal to zero. In other words, it's a linearly independent set. If for any finite subcollection, if you take a linear combination equal to zero, it must in fact be the so-called trivial combination. The trivial combination being the one with which all of the weights are zero, okay? So this is the definition of linear independence. Um, we define the empty set to be linearly independent. All right. It's taught, it's, it's just vacuously so because there's no vectors in it to violate the condition. So by default, the empty set is linearly independent. All right. Furthermore, if S is not linearly independent, we say it's linearly dependent. If S is not linearly independent, then S is linearly dependent. And sadly, I have no short abbreviation for that. <laughs> so as a, as a general point of order, I just say not li because it's less to write. <laughs> but if you want, you could say lindep. Now in the, in the notes I have that a finite set of vectors which contain zero is linearly dependent, I think this has nothing to do with finiteness, right? So here's a little theorem for you. If zero is an element of S, then S not linearly independent. Let's prove it. So you just do one times zero is equal to zero. So, you know, I have zero, I, I have zero as an S. So identify this is like my C1 equals to one, right? Which of course is not equal to zero. So this is a trivial, a co linear combination which was zero, and yet it is not the trivial combination. Therefore, S is linearly dependent. And it has nothing at all to do with S being finite. S could be an infinite set. This argument holds just the same. My notes have finite. I don't know why. I think it may be just a kind of a holdover from my previous version of the notes, which was scared of infinite things. I'm still scared of them, but there's things in the notes now. So it's okay. Yeah. Does that mean also countable and uncountably infinite? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, let's see here. Here's another useful proposition. That, that was more of a proposition than a theorem, but I called it a theorem. I, you know what? Since it's for infinite, for infinite, possibly infinite sets, it became a theorem. In the notes, it's only for a finite set, so it's a proposition. Yeah. If you think I'm saying something, you should judge again. Let's see here. So let V and W be non-zero vectors. All right, then V comma W are linearly dependent if and only if there exists K not equal to zero such that V is equal to K times W. Let us adopt the convention that if we write a list of vectors being linearly dependent, we are speaking of the set containing the list. So what I'm really saying is the set containing VW is linearly dependent. After all, I've only defined linear dependence and independence of sets of vectors, right? So like, anyway, yeah. So, <clears throat> all right, so if V and W are linearly dependent, what's that tell us? That tells us that we can write C1V plus C2W equals to zero, right? Where, you know, um, at least, you know, 
so at least one of these has to be non-zero, right? So let's suppose C1 is not equal to zero without loss of generality, yeah? Log without loss of generality. As such, we can do what? We can say, well, V is equal to minus C2W over C1, which is just K times W, where K is equal to minus C2 over C1. I guess I do need to prove C is, I need to prove that K is non-zero, right? Notice C2 equals to zero gives C1V equal to zero, which implies that V is equal to zero. Because, why? We know we're given that C1, we're assuming C1 is not equal to zero, right? We're also assuming in the precondition to this proposition that V is not equal to zero. One of the um, consequences of the axioms of vector space is that if you have a product of a scalar and a vector being zero, either the scalar is zero or the vector is zero. By process of elimination, this makes V equal to zero. But then that's a problem because V is what? Not equal to zero, right? Consequently, thus, C2 is not equal to zero by contradiction. All right, so then that gives us this little argument here is how I support my claim that this is not equal to zero, okay? Yeah. Oh yeah, very good. The previous proposition, exactly. Very good. And then the other direction, right? If V is equal to K times W for K not equal to zero, then what do you do? You just rewrite it. V minus KW equal to zero. So you got C1 equals to one. You got C2 equals to minus K. Hence, not linearly independent, right? Because this trivial combination does not force it to be, I mean, the, the linear combination being equal to zero does not force it to be the trivial combination. As you can see, the weights are not both zero. There's one, there's minus k. The one is enough, all right? This little proposition is very useful for examples. If you're faced with the question of a two element set being linearly dependent or independent, all you have to check is, is one a multiple of the other? I can usually just eyeball that, you know? Now, to check linear dependence or independence of three or more things, it requires calculation, yeah? Usually. All right, so let's see here. Show you guys another uh, proof here. So do, do, have you guys ever, uh, so in, in 221, what was your definition of linear dependence? Do you guys remember? Was it the same as the one I just gave? Essentially, Essentially but maybe you started with a set is linearly dependent, right? And by a set, I mean a set of column vectors, right? A set of column vectors is linearly dependent if one of the column vectors can be written as what? Right, as a linear combination of the others. And that could also be used as a definition of linear dependence here. And you could then um, say that if it's not linearly dependent, it's linearly independent. That logically could be done here as well. The reason I don't do that is because the definition of linear independence that I've given still works when we replace vector space with what's called a module. Now a module is like a vector space, but over a ring. All right, so like, let me show you an example. Just a, just a you know, little, little example here. So if we're in like Z6, um, and um, over Z6, you could look at something like this. Check this out, like two times three comma zero plus um, three times zero comma two is equal to six comma six, which is zero.
So in Z6, these are two vectors over Z6, over Z6, two vectors of Z6, whose linear combination is equal to zero. Yeah? But the coefficients are not zero. So that would make these, according to the, this would make these linearly dependent. These are linearly dependent vectors. Over the, over the, over, um, these are linearly dependent. Um, in, I guess my notation would be Z6, 2, right? This is a, this is, this is an example of what's called a Z6 module. You cannot write, there is no way you can write 3, 0 as equal to k times 0, 2. It's not possible. So that, that definition of linear dependence, that one can be written as a linear combination to the other, that only works if you're working over a field. Because only over a field can you do this calculation where you, well, let's, let's look at it. So that, that really brings us to the next theorem. Um, which I guess I probably should project because it's a little bit much to write down at the moment. Come on, projector. Arr. So let me tell you guys where we're going. We are um, on our way to embarking into the wild world of dimension theory, which is understanding like how do we define dimension? And how do we define bases for abstract vector spaces? What can we say about all that? Um, we can say a lot, actually, as we'll see. Um, but that'll, that'll take us a while to work through all that. So this is just the start. OK, so we need to know what spanning is. We need to know what linear independence is. And so today, we're just really trying to get the basics down. And um, so here was the next result I wanted to show you guys today. It was just this, which is, let's, let's, read, let's read the statement. It says, You've got a set of, you know, vectors, right? Notice that the list on the left-hand side is missing the jth one, all right? And so what it's saying is that that is a what? That is a linearly independent, linearly dependent set, if and only if the jth one is what? A linear combination of the remaining ones. This is exactly what we're just talking about. This is my, my, my claim is that over a field, we can do what you guys did in 221. We can say, well, it's linearly dependent if one of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the rest. And I'm just labeling that to be the jth one. All right? So if vj is in the span, then there exists constants that you can build the jth one as a linear combination. No, here's a sneaky way. You just say i not equal to j, right? C i v i. So if I take this c1 all the way da da da, um, c j minus one minus v j and then plus the rest. Sorry about. That. I think there's maybe a a LaTeX typo there, but uh, it seems kind of. I'll, I'll shut up. Who cares? Um, my point is, we have a linear combination, right? Now, I don't know if these coefficients are non-zero or not, but I know for sure that the one next to j is minus one. So we have a linear combination that's equal to zero, yet the coefficient of the jth one is non-zero. Therefore, that is not a linearly independent set. It's linearly dependent, which is what we're trying to prove. Conversely, if we suppose that this including the jth one is linearly dependent, then that means that there's this non-trivial linear combination, right? And so there's at least one constant um, say CJ, which is non-zero. Uh, <clears throat> I guess this, this statement, maybe this, uh, this statement, the proposition needs to be improved a bit. Like the real language here is that there exists a J. Uh, well, 
Fine. I, mean, I should say, um, if there exists a J such that VJ is in the span of the remaining vectors, right? I mean, we could put it into words. If one of the vectors in a span, if, if a vector is in the span of n minus one other vectors, right? Then that vector combined with the other n minus one vectors is a linearly dependent set and vice versa. So anyway, so here, um, I just assume that J is the non-zero one, and then you can divide by CJ, and you get this, which then shows that VJ is in the span of all the vectors except for the Jth one, which proves the other direction of the proof. So, yeah. <clears throat> Now, I have a bunch of examples. Maybe I should look at some of the example calculations next time, but um, I was going to tell you guys for the homework, like there's at least a problem in there too, which is solvable directly by the span theorem, right? For problem number 19 from the textbook, anybody work that one yet? Think so? What do you think? Subspace or not? What's that? Oh. So you're supposed to, it gives you this weird non-standard definition for vector space, R2, vector space operations on R2 for F2. I would encourage you there to look at axiom eight. So, sorry Daniel. Daniel was gonna sell, sell his solution, but I'm giving it away for free. Sorry, but um, Actually, that's a very interesting example. I found that all the axioms work except for the one that involves addition of scalars. So anyway, I will collect the homework, start a class next class. I hope you're done. But anyway, thanks, guys.